just one little video about the about about the speech, the speech okay so uh there are several reasons why imt is environment friendly uh the source is a natural source uh of the signal uh, some people say that MT, some, some people put MT together with the potential field methods, and this is not true because MT has a source, so I don't even consider uh, MT like a passive method. It's not a passive method at all. I mean, the only thing is that the, the, the source of the signal is, is natural. It's not man-made, but it's not a passive. It, it, there is a source. It's safe to operate. Uh, no, no, uh, there's no source, so we're not injecting currents, we're not using... Uh, high voltage and things like this. It's safe to people, safe to animals. The crews are small, so we have a small footprint, uh, and the equipment is portable. So let's start with uh, Maxwell's equations really briefly. I don't really want to go into the details of the method because it's there's so many things, uh, so many um, disciplines involved in, in learning MT. And uh, I, I, although I'm not a professor, I, I do have students and uh, I always tell them there are so many things involved in, uh, to learn. You know, so I, I don't want to go into so many of them. But Maxwell's equations, you have to talk about them. And uh, so these are Gauss's law for electricity and magnetism. And I put some pictures here to make it nice. And uh, Faraday's law of induction, which relates uh, like a, a varying magnetic field with time. Uh, generates an electric field and Ampere's law with Maxwell's term. And this is Maxwell. And um, so he was really responsible. These equations were there, but then he was really responsible for something very important, even Einstein recognized that, to unite these equations. And, and we use these equations until today. So he related the, the fact that magnetic field varying with time generates, generates an electric field, that electric field uh value in time generates a magnetic field. so that was this connection that was really a great his great contribution okay and then the method <clears throat> was developed by the findings of uh, these two gentlemen here rikitaki and uh, sihanov and uh, rikanar and rikitaki he first uh recognized that there was this relationship between the varying uh, uh magnetic field of the earth of external origin and the currents that were induced in the earth, the electric currents. And then uh, to one of the, um, they thought, oh, okay, we can use this, we can use Maxwell's equations, we can develop a method to survey the crust. And we can art, we really develop how we're going to show this curves of impulsivity and phase and you really like coined the, the name magnetic lyrics. So uh, these three were responsible for developing that the method that we that we know is as energy. Okay, and the source of MT signal is what? It's the naturally occurring magnetic field of the Earth of external origin. And why is that nice? Because the, the magnetic field varies from seconds to centuries, varies in a, in a wide range of frequencies. And that's why we can use this method to survey from pretty shallow, tens of meters, say, to tens of, of kilometers. So that, that's the interesting thing. And the source for the frequency below 1 hertz is um, the solar wind and the magnetic sphere interaction. And uh, one um, uh, geophysicist that works with us, is actually, he gave us this, uh, he found this movie that I think was really interesting. It's how the, the electrically charged plasma travels uh, across the, the, the space to reach to reach the earth and this movie is actually from uh, the physics department of the university of Osmo uh, to show how the auroras are formed but that's also you know shows how the um, uh how to say the, uh, the the source for for mt uh, works right so this is really interesting movie and you can see all of it there are all the details at the at, at the, at the so, yeah. Okay, and the source for frequencies uh, above one hertz, which we even call like the, the AMT method, the audio magnetic are generated uh, by lightning activity uh, around the equator and the interaction between the Earth and the ionosphere uh, uh, cavity. And so these 
uh, they, they resonate in this and they create this high frequency, high, higher frequency for us. Yeah? Uh, sources for, for energy, and we use these for uh, mining, for water resources, and sometimes for the for some applications that we use now for uh, uh, solar and wind power. And uh, here are some examples of uh, our our crews yeah, from from spot and image. And some the crews they can be small. This is like a, a crew that we do some work, uh, some audiomagnetic work. work. So audiomagnetic work, the, the the coils are smaller, so we don't really need a lot of people. And the other crews here. Uh, let's say about 20 people or less, you know, they can, uh, depending on the, of course, depending on the logistics, they can take care of like uh, surveying like 400 or more stations and covering like tens of kilometers, you know, hundreds of kilometers like we did before. So you can see like this is a small crew that can do a big survey. And of course, you know, this is small footprint. And here um, I have just some examples of uh how the how the the, the the parts of the equipment of an uh, mt equipment how much they weigh you know and uh, how, how they are you know they're not so big the things just uh, maybe the, the broadband coils are a little bit bigger like one and a half meters long but nothing that you know anybody can handle and uh, i shouldn't say that but i, I have even taken my kids to the field <laughs> Maybe that's why they don't want us to do your business, but that's okay. Anyway, so um, we, you know, so you can see that it's not a big deal, and uh, you know, we can um, easily uh, carry these around, and uh, it's not, it's not like some other equipment that you still have. And here I have some examples of uh, of the coils. And it's like an AMT coil and the electrodes. So you just take like a maybe like a thirty centimeter hole. To, to, to dig them. They're actually, today there are smaller, even smaller uh, electrodes, even lighter electrodes, and uh, a, a battery and uh, with a receiver, a laptop. So it's not really um, a lot of equipment that you have to that you have to carry. And uh, here is like a, a cartoon that's just from the Phoenix Manual, and uh, on on the layout. So. The layout is pretty much like a, a, a cross. Now we are measuring then uh, two components. This is a on uh, onshore onshore survey. We are measuring uh, two components of the electric field, you know, like north and south and west east. And the electric field is measured uh, uh, in volts per meter. So really, it's like a voltage difference. And um, we and we measure three components of the of the magnetic field. And the X in the Cartesian coordinates, X is really um, pointed to the to the north. Yeah? We usually uh, point everything to the magnetic north using a compass, and then we can rotate the whole uh, the whole uh, ensemble to you know the to a stripe or something. So we have uh, for the magnetic field H X, H Y, and H Z is um, it's vertical. And here, just a picture of you can see like the the H Z coil here. And you can see the electric field, um, uh, the electric field cables here. So it's not a big deal in an environment like this. It's not a big deal, but even in some others, like in a forest, we did work in the in the Amazon. It's not uh, such a big deal. We don't have to tear down the trees or anything. You can pass the cable around the tree, so it's it's pretty nice. Okay, and then um, processing is is usually done using uh, there there are some codes around, but. Uh, usually you do the processing uh, using the algorithms, the, the code, the, the, the programs that were supplied by the manufacturer of the equipment. And what you get at the end after processing, uh, we, we acquire the data and the time domain, the Fourier transform to the frequency domain, and we have two curves because we have um, two components of the electric and magnetic field we have two apparent resistivity and phase curves here. Uh, one that relates uh, the north electric to the west east uh, magnetic, and uh, and the other curve that relates the electric uh, west east to the magnetic uh, north component. So we have two curves. So this is uh, the curve on one sounding, 
along the period. So the longer the period, the, the smaller is the frequency, the longer the period, the deeper your sound. And uh, this is uh, a curve which is from uh, like a sedimentary basin. So you see uh, first the sediments at, at the at shallow, and then you enter the sediments, uh, really the, the basin. And then when you're leaving the basin, you get to the, to the basement. Then the curves are splitting. When these curves split, usually means that you have a lateral discontinuity, a fault, and that's very powerful um, for the MT method to be able, if you, if you work with MT and you look a lot of curves after a while, just by looking at the curves, you can already uh, interpret a little bit what's going on. You know, when the curves are together like this here, it looks like there's a little bit of static shift. So I'm not gonna talk about this today. And, uh, but just by looking at the curves, you can, you can already tell if it's like a 1D environment, a 2D, or even sometimes if you have 3D effects. I have data that shows some 3D effects uh, in the phase. And then um, the data, MT data, uh, to, to obtain a final model of the Earth, now we, we have like a resistivity model at that, we use the inversion. So the inversion is pretty much, you use a modeling algorithm, which will, the modeling algorithm will um, give you what we call the synthetic curves. Yeah? And then you try to match these synthetic curves with the curves like this one that you acquired in the field. Yeah? So what you do, you start with a model. And here, this is a cartoon actually from um, a paper from Montalhado from 2012. And what he's doing here, he's using um, seismic and marine magnetolurics, gravity and magnetic all together. So each one has its starting model. You start with a simple model, let's say, and then you calculate these curves, the synthetic curves, and you see if they match. Oh, do they match with the curves that are acquired in the field? No. Okay, then you go back and you modify your 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 uh, your model, your initial model, but actually an inversion that's done uh, automatically and you don't have to do it by hand. And, uh, and then until the model uh, creates, generates uh, a curve, a yeah, synthetic curve that is like your curve that you acquired in the field. Then you have your, your final model. In our case, it's a model of uh, resistivity. It can be a layered 1D, it can be 2D, it can be 3D uh, of resistivity in that. And that's, that's very nice, I'm going to show, because, for example, in a... In, in, in seismic, for example, you the first thing that you get is a model in time. How can you, I mean, what are you going to do with the with, with time model? You know, you have to transform it to depth, which is which is pretty costly in terms of in computational cost and inversion. An uh, energy inversion is not so so costly. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go into into the examples. Okay, so I'm going to talk first about uh, enlarged frontier basins. I'm going to talk about two uh, examples from the National Petroleum Agency and two basins in Brazil. Um, I'm going to talk about one example in the mature basin. That was something that uh, people, oh, can you use MT in, a, in more detailed areas? You know, that was a question. Actually, one of, of our clients, Mr. Miura, here from Brazil, he, he was the one that, ah, but don't you think you can use MT in the reconquer base, in these uh, mature bases. So, so it was really nice of him. And, and, and later, also, uh, the National Petroleum Agency, we go to the National Petroleum Agency, uh, recognized, you know, after a, a lot of presentations, a lot of understanding courses and things like this, it was very nice the work done by the National Petroleum Agency. But they understood magnetic alloy, they, uh, they understood electric, uh, uh, electromagnetic methods. And they accepted these methods as an exploration tool, and that was very good for because several companies started working uh, and using electromagnetic now. And then I'm going to talk about also MT uh, in Bolivia, which is like a different environment, and in Brazil, you know, in the foothills, much more complicated. And two works uh, MMT marine magnetic works in, in Brazil and Uruguay. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. So this is uh, a map of Brazil, and this is the Paris Basin. 
And this is the very large Parana Basin, which has like a, it's covered by the Serra Geral Basalt, very complicated for, for seismic methods, but with MT, we got some great imaging. And these were the two projects uh, that were uh, sponsored by the National Petroleum Agency. And then I'm gonna talk about the Reconquerable Basin, where you can see, you can barely see, we have very much smaller basin. Machu was the first uh, basin where oil was, uh, was found in Brazil, but it's still still working, still companies interested in this in, in basin. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about then the, the first of the large base, the Parsi, ba Parsi Basin, and it's very large basin. It's uh, un like it's it's pretty much unknown this basin. There's very little work done, but the work that the National Petroleum Agency did uh, was very important to redefine like the stratigraphic column, some some other information, geological information. And uh, this basin uh, is is divided in three in two sub basins here by the the Vilena Arch and the Serra Formosa Arch. And here in the the, the dark um, uh, symbols here are the the four station, no the four lines, sorry the four uh, profiles that were acquired by by the National uh, Petroleum Agency. And uh, we're going to, to concentrate so you, you can see also, um, I, I would like, since I'm talking about environmental friendly, then I should, I should talk about this in the Paris City Basin. Uh, start with this. Uh, this area has a lot of um, uh, native land, protected native land. And together with the native, protected native land, this area is the area of uh, very large farms and, and uh, these farms produce, uh, for, for example, soy and corn and uh, cotton. And this, this, in this area here in Brazil, in this state, this state is the largest soy produce, producer in the world. Okay, so there are two aspects here. Uh, you know, the to the people, the native people that live there, and also the the farms, which are very important for the economy in Brazil. So we had to take care. I know when I say the environment, we have to think about the natural environment, of course, but also the environment where people are living, things they are uh, providing for us. So here, when you see uh, the, this line tree, you know, it's all uh, shifted because there was a, a, a reservation here and here, an uh, Indian uh, native area here, and, and we could enter. We have to have like a 10 kilometer, um, 10 kilometer area to, uh, how can I say, to, to, to uh, distance from from the, the native land, okay. And I'm going to concentrate now on the on uh, provide information about the line seven. But th this uh, project was extremely interesting. Uh, let me show you some pictures first um, of uh, Mato Grosso. Okay, so I can tell there's forest. Um, there's uh, large plantations here. I think it's soy. Large rivers, huge rivers. And uh, some animals here, but, you know, but um, uh, they didn't bother us. I mean, I hope we didn't bother them. It was really, really a nice place to work. And it's just a picture of, of the empty equipment in a, in a soil plantation that was just started when we went there in September, actually. September, that's when they started uh, to, to start um, growing the, the, the soil. And some of the guys in the crew, okay. So here, um, so I'm going to talk about this line here, um, which is line seven, which is from uh, northwest to south, southeast. Okay, and uh, you can see this is the seismic line, but it's like the, the seismic line. It's not the, just the the uh, the, the uh, time migrated. This is a uh, sweetness, uh, which is a <clears throat> type of um, how can I say it? it's a, the type of processing that you do to the, to the seismic line. This line is in, in, in time, okay? Uh, and uh, you can see that the quality, the, the, the quality of the line of the, the seismic is not, is not so good, but look at the, at the MT. And the, with, with the MT, you can see, um, you know, the, the first, the Botucatu sandstones, Okay, the that relate to, to the seismic, but in the seismic you can barely uh, track the, the the reflector here, and uh, the silicon plastic of the Paraná group, which is 
well marked here on the seismic, okay? And the Arara group. And then you can see much better here. We can, we can barely trace here what we guess it's the basement in the seismic, but in the MT, especially in the shallower portion, we can, we can see the basement, not only the basement, but the, the faults, faults, faults here in the basement really, really well and in a way delimit the, 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 the basement. So when you think of the, the, the time involved, the cost involved, the impact involved to uh, obtain a, 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 an image like this and to obtain an image like this, so you can see the value of the of, of MG in a basin like La Okay, so the other project from the National Volume uh, Agents was in the on the Parana Base and the Parana Base. I'm not even going to talk about seismic because they have uh, the Serra Geral, the Serra Geral basalt is one of the largest flood basalts in the in, in, in the world. And uh, you can imagine that the, the seismic imaging below the basalt, so some of the basalt columns uh, are like two kilometers thick. So um, we have some other uh, projects there uh, that I'm not going to show here with, with great image if someone wants the, the, the papers I can provide. So here's the, the Parna Basin. This is where the, the work was done, mostly in the, in the deepest part of the basin. There were three. Uh, profiles that were um, uh, acquired here, and uh, I'm going to concentrate on this profile here from uh, southwest to northeast because this profile uh, here, my, my picture is not you have the one very uh, important feature here, which is the let me just put this, which is the Ponta Grossa Arch, which is the, the, the Ponta Grossa Arch. Here. Now, and, and this profile is, is crossing the, the Ponta Grossa. Uh, okay, and here, uh, these pictures were provided by, by Northwest and some pictures of the area. And again, uh, this whole area has uh, has farming, has a lot of farming. Okay, actually, uh, this area uh, where the acquisition was done is this, is was done in the state of Sao Paulo. And Sao Paulo is the, like, how can I say, like the most developed state in Brazil in terms of industry and things like this. And uh, so we have to be careful here with the impact in, in the people and the farm. So uh, this is like the remote station that was set up and was all, um, uh, you know, they had to protect it because of the animals that were probably in a, in, a, in a farm. Okay. And okay. So finally, let me go to the to the models. Okay. And this um, of that line. Um, that cross the Ponta Grossa Arch, and um, what I'm, I'm showing here two two uh, models, two interpretations. Uh, one is Figure Seven of, uh, of the paper from Pauchin, another in 2017, and the other one is from Eric Correa, who, who works with us, and he did his uh, his masters using this the same data. And what I want to show here is the consistency. Although you have two different groups interpreting the data, you still see the same features, uh, mostly here, which is very important here, the Ponta Grossa Arch. Okay, and, and blue, of course, is, uh, I didn't say that before, but blue is more resistive and red is more conductive in the pictures that, I, that I'm showing here. And you can see uh, the Bauru sandstones, you can see in the blue the Serra Geral uh, seals and, and, and dikes and everything, and the Ponta Grossa arch in both models. Okay, and uh, on the on the back of uh, Eric's picture here, of Eric Correa's picture here, is the seismic, and you can this seismic provides very little contribution to the knowledge to the knowledge of the, the basin because exactly of these uh, basalts, yeah. but but here from from the MT, you can not only see the the the, the, the basalts very clear, the the Ponta Grossa, the large features very well. You can also uh, define the, the the sediment. You can define the basin. And we have some other papers in the Parana Basin that I can send if someone is interested. Okay, so now let me talk about the. Uh, 
the account of Basin, which is uh, for me like a very good representation of these uh, smaller uh, mature basins in Brazil, starting with the, the Potiguari on the top, and Sergipe, Alagoas, and Reconcovo, and Spiritu Santo. So these um, Reconcovo is part of this Reconcovo, Tucano, uh, Jacobá, this whole uh, sequence here. And uh, uh, it's an aborted uh, rift, rift now. So it started opening during the Atlantic and just stopped it asymmetric. And was the first area in Brazil where oil was, was, was found. <clears throat> and you can see here all these uh, colors here, uh, the, the blocks that are uh, that are or were up for, for bid by the National Petroleum Union. So you can see there's a lot of interest still in, the, in, this, in this basin. And I don't know if you can see, but I can clear um, uh, here these, um, uh, by these limits here, are the fields that are, are producing there. Okay. And uh, like, like I said, okay, so what is um, what is the issue here in terms of the environment? Like I said, you know, here is mostly like the, the like a human environment. We're working in, in close to cities. Uh, we were all working, you know, there, there are kids running around, they're like animals around, um, you know, in some places that they have a eucalyptus plantation, and in this example here, for example, we were setting up the equipment on the backyard of this lady, we have to, to, to watch out for their animals and everything, mostly that they don't eat our cable, uh, but still, né? and uh, so, you know, MT, again, I mean, to, to, to run an empty survey in, in, a, in a situation like this, I mean, you're not going to harm anybody. You're not going to bother anybody. Actually, there was a lot of seismic done in this, uh, in this basin before. And uh, that was the first question. Oh, are you going to explode something? Are you going to... No, 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 no. I mean, so actually, probably a little bit hard because we're coming after the seismic. You know? and, and what, what uh, I advocate a lot is like, do... I mean, it's not not to 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 do the time, but like do an MT first, and then you already have a good idea of, of the geology of the structure without creating too much stress, and then you can even uh, design your your size much much better. So um, I like to show these pictures. This and that I like very much to to, and uh, so here. Uh, this is a, a little movie that I created of a 3D, a, a 3D model. These are two two blocks. Each block is like five by five kilometers. Uh, the shallow portion is the we, we could map very well is the um, uh, San Sebastian Aquifer, which is a very important aquifer um, there in the area, not only uh, for providing uh, water for the people, but all, all, also there are lots of like uh, beer and, and um, um, you know, water industry in that area because that, that water is very good quality. And we can see also in green the the basement deep into the southeast. Uh, you can see the sediments uh, channeled, and there were a lot of uh, some other features that we uh, that we uh, interpreted for the client with, with this model was, was, was really was really nice. And in the pink, you can see the, the sediments here. And uh, this, this was very nice work at the end of this provision. Okay, so now let me go to a more challenging environment in Bolivia, okay? So uh, these works were provided uh, to me both by um, by Northwest and by uh, Evans Lazaro from from PFB. and uh, they uh, realized several projects in in the south and central uh, Subiandian region, uh, focused on the uh, Rua Mampampa, Santa Rosa geological formations. You know, and these are all like overthrust, resistive, overconductive, high velocity, over low velocity, and uh, you know, and that's where the their um, uh, hydrocarbon caps are. Okay, so very challenging environment. You can see the from the topography. Sometimes they had to use helicopters, um, or they had to walk, or they had to take a, a boat or canoe or something. The cars got stuck. No roads. 
uh, or very precarious roads. And again, this whole area in Bolivia, visited Bolivia also, they also have a lot of uh, uh, native land, protective native land. So, uh, you know, the guys from Northwest had to go there and explain what they're doing, show like this picture here in the middle, show the equipment, tell the people what they're doing. And uh, actually they had some of the, the I think it's called Mozete people working for them also in the group. And it's, uh, when you get to a place like this, it's always nice to have also uh, the local people. We also do that a lot to have the local people working for you because it's, it's easier to get access to the areas they know everything, they know where to go, they know other people when you need to get permission. So also it's a way to, to providing for the people that are there, you know, some type of work. Also, it's 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 a nice way to, to do. So again, uh, this area, there was a, a actually like a, a area of preservation where they could not work. And uh, also they had to be very careful with the native people. So actually, when you look around, like in, in Latin America in general, in South America, we still have a lot of, we still take a lot of care with the people, uh, with, the, with the native people here. You know, if you come to Brazil, if you come to South America, to Latin America, you, you see that. And uh, so here's one of the examples, now. this is uh, the, the first work that was done in the central part. And uh, you can see here, uh, Synclines and, and anticlines and synclines. So this area is all very, very, uh, well, just very complicated. And the, the location of, of, of some uh, possible wells and all the, the empty, the empty profile. In the second work uh, here the, that I'm going to show this to from the uh, central part, from the south part, and the southern part was the, the Itacarai uh, project uh, here in this little blue here. No? And uh, actually, it's the Itacarai block is here in pink. And these are the, the lines of empty lines that were applied for Itacarai. So always the same pattern. You, know? you have this, this pattern of uh, synclines and anticlines, and you're doing the, the empty lines uh, perpendicular to the structure too. To be able to, to image them. Uh, both projects were around uh, 400 uh, stations each, uh, full tensor position, and time domain was done in some stations for to correct for the for the for the static sheet. And uh, they were doing uh, one two one two and three D inversion of of the Okay, so uh, uh, so these are the the two D versions. For the for the central um, okay. central on the on the project man, on these lines here, so one line more to the say, to the northwest, to the middle, to the to, to more to the end of the the project, and you can you can see uh, <clears throat> very nicely here uh, the, the the synclines and anticlines all showing here in the all the models, and I guess later they. They, they could put this in a, in a 3D model, they could see much better the, uh, all these features. And uh, for the Takarai project here, you see, uh, you know, it's changing here. They have a, uh, the, a controlled inversion, a 2D inversion that they, they did uncontrolled and controlled inversion. And this controlled inversion was uh, uh, done with the help of the or, or well or some of the information. But what they told me for this project that the seismic provided very, very little. You know, you have this uh, high velocity over low velocity, and then you have needed to have some some problem. Okay, so um, I'm just going to show two slides here of this this project. Uh, this was the first marine and sea project that was done uh, in the zoo. And uh, for this project was really nice. I worked with Andres Elili, and then the work uh, after uh, the data was acquired, the data was also um, the Observatório Nacional participated in the project, and I guess they did other work with this. But this was the first work. Um, well, let me explain. So this is uh, uh, the Santos Basin offshore, offshore Brazil, and there was already 
uh, uh, a seismic line here in the in this area and the seismic line was interesting because it went from shallow to deep waters and also in the samples close to uh you know to, to large fields close to some blocks that were up for, for bid and then they also uh applied this work with them by western gco electromagnetic at the time uh was acquired two off uh off uh, profiles here from the main profile and the idea was like okay and and she was never done in brazil so let's assess the quality of the data from the shallow end to the to the to the deep end of the basin and the other important thing here is um the environmental agency in brazil uh is very strict in allowing seismic in shallow waters so you pretty much cannot get if you have uh, 50 meters uh, of, of water depth, you cannot get a, a license to, to do anything, to do any exploration. So this is also a way, and we, we got permission. Actually, MT doesn't have permission, doesn't need a permission, it has a, like a waiver for, for uh, environmental license, we, we get a waiver in Brazil. So this is important, very important to say. You know, we just have to, uh, how to say, to, to, to tell the environmental agency uh, of Brazil or the states, environmental agencies of the states that we are going to do this acquisition and explain everything, okay, but we don't really need a, a, a license, we don't need to do environmental impact, nothing. And um, uh, so it was, was, that was interesting to, important information too, and we were allowed to, to do this project with no, no problem. And this was presented in 2008 uh, at the EHD. And uh, here on the top, you see the, okay, in this case, marine MT, then you have uh, uh, red, uh, red is more resistive and blue is more conductive. So that's, you know, because this is the water here, the, the, the contour, and this is the line going from uh, closer to the land and getting deeper and deeper. I think it's like maybe like two kilometers back. And uh, these are some examples of the of the data that, that were acquired. And you can see uh, different features. You can see the, the, the basement and some salt domes. Okay, and the, the model here at the bottom was the model that was derived from the seismic that they had there. And this model, uh, the MMT model with the seismic model, they match pretty well, but the MMT model just like what you saw in the Paris Sea, especially in shallow in shallow depths, uh, it, it could uh, define where the basement was much better than than the seismic. You know, there are so many uh, what we call this in seismic. You know, we have all these reflections, um, multiple, and then it's very difficult to okay. Well, what is this? Is it a multiple? Is it the the real reflector? So in MT we don't have that. So could define much better where the where the basement was. So that was that was a good, good contribution. There was some paper that paper from Gallardo that I showed before uh, with the inversion was also um, based on, on this what use this data. Yeah. And the other project uh, that I'm gonna show uh, this was was done uh, we uh, had little participation in allowing for uh, helping uh, to find out the boat and, and everything and, uh, so this was a project conducted uh, by Scripps and uh, this uh, professor Steve Constable, Dallas Sherman that did her uh, PhD on this and Annie Orange and was a, was a very nice project and uh, here you have a picture of the uh, the marine uh, magnetic fluid receiver so these are the, the boys that help it to float uh, in yellow here you see as a cross now it looks like a looks, looks, looks like a spider these are the electric field yeah, the uh, sensors and the magnetic field sensors are sticking out here okay and uh, here on the bottom you see that's the um, the concrete anchor so that will anchor the equipment to the bottom and then when the uh, it's it's uh, the, the survey is finished and a signal is sent. The, the the concrete anchor is tied to the equipment. 
buy buy some you know, cable, um, how do you say like a yeah like a metal uh, uh, cable, and then uh, that cable burns. The, the concrete um, anchor stays on the bottom and it flows and it's uh, the, the equipment is uh, how do you say is fish. So I have here a, a little movie. I hope it's not. It's very loud, but it's an interesting move, you know. They put a GoPro on this um, little anchor that they throw. It's on the side of a uh, script. You can you can download this. So, oh, I think, I think it is. You see, so they uh, catch it, the, the equipment, and then they bring it to the. To the, to the boat and you can see you can see the, the the sensors the magnetic sensor you can see the legs and you can see here on the deck all the other equipment on the deck. it's a very very nice project okay. let me go down to the interesting side okay so uh so uh uh scripts uh, uh, Steve and Dallas allowed us to, to show this data and what we did we took their 2D versions and we put together in the in the in the in the 3D Eric and I and we, we saw something really interesting and uh, Eric found this um, Eric Correa works with me he found uh, he looked at the the this map and in a the, the paper and uh, what you see you see here this from from the paper from Soto and others in 2011. You see uh, the continental crust, the, the, and then in the transitional crust here, you see uh, there's a there's a, 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 a low, there's like a valley. It's the Rio de la Plata transform system, and it segments the seaward dipping reflectors uh, in two. Okay, so you have one wedge, and you have a, a, a segment one and, and segment two. Okay, and the lines, the MMT lines, there were five uh, profiles here, they're passing right on this Rio de la Plata uh, transform zone. Okay, so we had the, the, the inversion of, of these three, of these uh, two inversions of these five lines, then we put, put them together in a cube. You can see this is the main line, and you can really see the, the segmentation here. Now you, and then you, you can see uh, both uh, the, the basement and the the the, po the the po the basement and the post drift so you can see very clearly the two segmented um, portions of these uh, seaward uh, reflectors so you know sometimes uh, if you if you visualize the data in a different way you can start finding all kinds of information and I'm going to show that also with the with the mining with the project that that we did so. This we would like now to develop more of this uh, probably into into a paper uh, with the with, with scripts with Steve and Al. Okay, so now I'm going to go into the the mining applications, and uh, so this this was a work that we did when we were then uh, in the Paris Basin, and uh, we were approached by uh, actually a farmer, but he had a concession for a mining area. And he, um, so, you know, again, this is this Brazil, this is the state, state of Mato Grosso, the Paris Basin is like here. And uh, we're gonna be working uh, in this uh, called uh, named Juina. And uh, here in Juina, in this area, there is in the, the this, uh, red dots are the locations of, uh, of Kimberlite. And this area is very well known for industrial grade diamonds. Okay, so just industrial grade diamonds, huh? really like you're gonna put it on the ring or anything but anyways and we were working on this uh, little area here in uh, in red okay so this is the the area of the concession that uh, that we had and he said look we already excavated and we know there is a kimber light here in this uh, in this area here okay fine we think that there's uh, there's another one here it's another area of interest, and we just want you to more detail it, okay? And, and this, we might have something here, might have something in this inter, 
interesse one and interesse three, we might have something, some, something here. Now, this area, they had uh, sandstones, conglomerates, they had different, uh, and just to, to, to just, again, you know, we are really, this is jungle. This is, this is in green, it's jungle. These are, those are uh, 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 rivers, streams. Okay, so again, very complicated area. You don't want to, to bug anybody. So we designed like this AMT survey in a, in a, in a mesh. Okay, and uh, again, remember we have this Kimber like one here that we already thought okay, it's, it's there. So what we did, we, we, we did uh, one D inversions for all, we did something very simple. We did just one D inversions for the MT for all these, uh, these are the uh, locations in, in black here, the little black lines, the locations of the station. And then we uh, delimited uh, through the, uh, with, with different, we tried different uh, resistivity, different value of resistivity to delimit, delimit the bodies. And this is the location of the, that uh, Kimberlite K1. So it was, was very interesting. As soon as we put all the 1Ds into a 3Ds, uh, all these bodies uh, appeared. And interesting. So the, the one that was already there was confirmed. And actually, you know, uh, coming to the surface and its resistivity, it's more conductive. Right here is like blue, more resistive, red, more conductive. Help to uh, delineate the body in this area of interest one and this other area of interest here you see this is where oh we want to detail because he thought that the timber like was here no it was a little bit shifted from where they thought it was i mean at least from from our data so i got a little bit carried off carried out with these movies after i learned how to do them so you can see there on the top the timber like one and here uh, at the bottom of the picture where it should be the other uh, Kimber light that they thought that yeah, was a little bit shifted. And the other one that we could find, the other area of interest up to, to the north, we couldn't get in. It was a farm and it didn't allow uh, the guys to, to go in. So, but this was very nice, nice work too. Just, you know, you, you Visualize the data in different ways to start seeing all kinds of Okay, so um, well, here uh, I, I added to this presentation uh, a work from Australia because uh, I thought was was really interesting and had to do with the work in, in Chile. And um, you know, I took this quote from this paper from from Heisen in two thousand um, and eighteen, um, and so what, what he states is that these world-class uh, mineral system, world-class um, uh, deposits are generated deep in the, in the crust and, and mantle. Yeah? So I'm gonna show two examples, one from Chile and another one from, from Australia and how uh, you, know, you work with audio magnetics with AMT to define your, your, your target but then you can use an MT in a broadband and long period MT to the point where to, to look for other, other deposits. Yeah? So uh, the example in Chile was provided to me by Dr. Jaime Araya and Gonzalo Yanez. And they did lots of uh, these regional scale works to, um, to understand uh, the structure of the volcano, the subduction zone, okay? And they apply this, uh, this information together with AMT to try to understand how these deposits uh, were created there, you know? And they have two, uh, I think, yeah, El Teniente and Los Pelamos. And these two are the largest, I think El Teniente is the largest of the, of the uh, copper porphyry deposits in, in the world. And, uh, Martin Answorth, he provided me with a, a like a more uh, recent paper, 2019. Pete Hollings also, was, was nice. And um, 
uh, Jaime sent me these pictures. Said, "Ah, but I'm gonna send you these pictures, but you can barely see where the stations, uh, where the empty stations are." Or, and I thought, "Okay, this is interesting to show because then, yes, I mean, look, there's no impact whatsoever. I mean, see how many people, and uh, with MT, yes, equipment is small, so you have to, you know, put on the, your GPS where where you set up your equipment because depending on you have lots of trees." A high grass or something you're gonna be it's like looking for a car in the parking lot in the in the shopping center you know you're gonna never find it so uh this i thought this was interesting uh picture to show that you cannot you cannot really you know it doesn't pollute the, the environment usually uh, to have an empty service <clears throat> okay so um now Jaime sent me uh this this uh, picture with all the work that was done you know this the subduction zone here in the in the west of, uh, of south america and work uh, done by by german teams together with them and then um uh, martin sent me this paper from 2019 which has a very nice picture you know you see in uh in the black here uh where where it's marked the subduction zone and then the yellow more conductive you see all these little finger look like they're going to the to the volcanoes these triangles here are the, the volcanoes and uh, the star is the location of uh, of an earthquake so i mean this picture is, is really really nice because it shows and i'm going to show a picture from australia how uh this uh, uh deep uh, these deep processes are influencing uh, these, these deposits and then you'll find these deposits all over uh, here uh, the, the, the the coast of the west coast of, of, of south america and like i said um so just to to give um uh, like like an idea here these are uh the 25 largest known porphyry cor uh, copper deposits and the El Teniente is the in central chile is the largest one and then chile chile <laughs> Montana, Chile, Mexico, Utah, Chile, Los Colombia, and Chile. You can see all, everything concentrated in, in these zones. So, you know, that has to be, uh, so you can, you can see why MT, uh, a, a deep survey, will uh, provide you with information about where to find these large deposits. So they probably still exist. And, uh, and then I have here, a picture then of uh, you know uh, telomeres, and so they look for what they look for. This is a little bit out of other place, but telomeres is the end, and so but this this cartoon now is the AMT cartoon. Okay, so from the AMT they can define the the, the fault zones, you know where the, uh, the the veins are, where where the location of these. To, to bear the limit, the, uh, the, the, the deposits at a, at a shallower depth. Yeah? So they did, this work was done actually when um, Gonzalo Yanet was working for Codelco, and this work is not really, these works are not really published. And although this was like a, the, the original presentation was a Latin American presentation, but I, I thought to add this one from Australia because it's really interesting. And, um, <clears throat> And, and this is uh, the work done uh, around close to the Olympic Dam deposit and uh, several other deposits here in uh, with these little stars, Titan, Volcom. And um, okay, so you have the, the profile uh, AA prime here in black and uh, these uh, blue uh, triangles all over. Yeah? Uh, the empty station, the broadband station, and the black dots are the uh, long period stations. And also, there was a seismic line that was reprocessed, like a like a here, like a little shadow under it. Yeah? And um, so, this was really nice work because, again, you know, from from the deep work, you can see uh, uh, the Olympic Dam, you can see again the fluid melt uh, pathways, you know, little question mark here. The upper mantle, the uh, here, the limit between the vertical and the toe uh, crust. 
and then you can see look they look like little fingers you know you can, you can see a pathway to locum to olympic dam and to two other ones here and then there's like a little question mark here because it looks like there's something else here and this picture looks a lot like the picture that i showed from from chile right so this is something to think uh for the for the mining community to maybe look into more of this type of of, of project projects to to provide information um for, for the mineral exploration uh, okay and uh now i'm gonna shift start shifting more from exploration exploration or gas mining to more like really like environment right and uh, uh one interesting thing uh here in brazil that we found out for groundwater okay is that really like the uh, exploration for groundwater was almost like a byproduct of uh the the, the other surveys that we were doing uh, so, for example, in this example here that I'm showing, uh, and I showed this before, I showed the Reconcova Basin, uh, we could image very, very well the, the San Sebastian uh, aquifer in Bahia. And, uh, you know, we're doing an oil and gas survey, and then we see um, an aquifer. And uh, this paper here is an old paper from Max Meju and the guys from Observatório Nacional, and I'm not going to show it. Just gonna put the reference here because again they were just doing uh, one type of work and then um, they they helped uh, find the fractured uh, uh, water reservoirs. Okay, in here uh, we can see this is the again the San Sebastian aquifer and the and the well and we uh, we saw that the the well where the well is. Um, um, producing, okay, it matched the same depths that we had from our 3D survey. So just to show that. So this is all in Bahia State, also in the in the east of Brazil. Okay, and uh, and we have another project that we proposed like a strategy. Again, we went there to do another project type of project, and we used the AMT uh to the limit so this is like we were working on the on a high area on the top of a mountain very arid but then we could uh really see this Morro de Chapelle water uh reservoir here okay and we can see the the uh the rocky surface the reservoir the Morro de Chapelle formation very well in the curve and in the 1G, 1G model. And the 1G model helped us uh, find out where the recharge area was. So this recharge area, so th this cartoon relates very well to the data that we collect, the recharge area of the aquifer. And then we could uh, track where the, where the aquifer was. Okay, so, I'm almost done here. Alan, um, talk about the renewables really quickly. I'm not gonna show a lot of stuff, okay? So uh, just to show uh, that in Latin America, just Mexico and Brazil are ahead in terms of uh, wind and solar installed capacity, and it's growing a lot. So uh, actually uh, from the Clean Energy Review, they show that uh, Latin America is ahead because first of all, we use hydroelectric power plants, so we're using another renewable energy, and now we're moving towards uh, a lot of solar and, and wind. So Latin America is doing well in that. Um, uh, geothermal in Colombia, uh, I uh, met at an online workshop. I met uh, Daniela Bless, and she talked about the work that it, that's been done. It's like a, a multi-country, <laughs> how can I say? Uh, project from UNESCO, okay, to work on geothermal projects in Colombia. Uh, she, she told me they're not reusing really MT, but just to show that there is work, there is opportunity there for, for MT in Colombia. And uh, in Mexico, um, uh, the, this work was shared with me, it was really nice. Uh, uh, 
you know, so they did like first a study to look for uh, for, for key uh, problems, the geothermal problems, you know? and you have this uh, this whole subduction area here in Mexico, which is also a, a place for um, a good place for geothermal exploration. And Diego uh, and uh, Jose Manuel and Claudia, they provided me with this uh, with this work, uh, Los Homeros project, né? and with MT they mapped. So here's the geothermal area, okay, Los Homeros, né? and uh, so they did the MT line here, and they can see the conductive plane, the resist resistive core, and the deep conductor uh, that that. Um, how can I say that feeds the, the geothermal uh, reservoir? Okay, and again, uh, at different depths, what is mapped from the from the geothermal um, reservoir? So you know you can see now there is a lot of contrast. Uh, contrast. Uh, the temperature also gives like a lot of contrast for in, in MT resistivity contrast. And that's another strength uh, MT used for geothermal. Alan probably, you know, he, he knows a lot of, about this geothermal application in, in Ireland and everything. And um, okay, so this uh, this was really interesting work that was done. Ah, no, actually, this was Mexico. This was this was Chile. Really, really quick. Uh, this was very interesting. I found in, uh, in the Geotech site. In Geotech, they use uh, th they have this method, which is like a flying MT. They measure the the vertical the vertical field, and they also have some sensors in the uh, on the on, on the floor, on the ground, and they did uh, this work in the Lirima. So they had uh, in the they have like 3D magnetoluric on the uh, Pampa Lirima block. And they could see also the, the clay cap uh, and the uh, uh, resistive uh, uh, structure and the faulting and everything, but it was not very defined. So they used this um, uh, geotax uh, uh, method to map the shallower the shallower part, and it really matches here. So you have the, but it's more detailed. You have the the clay cap and you have the resistive structure. So. And now I'm going to go into uh, really quick. I'm going to talk about this. Um, uh, the resistivity applied for uh, hydroelectric power plants for solar and wind. So uh, at first they were doing resistivity measurements only at very shallow areas. And then they realized that when you have um, transmission lines, when you have the, the, uh, a large solar plant, the wind towers, they're affected by, by lightning. Then you needed more information about the, the resistivity of the deep ground to provide uh, a, 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 a more uh, robust uh, grounding project for these for these areas. So here we work for this uh, this high voltage uh, DC area in the northwest of Brazil. Uh, so uh, what we did, uh, we run some uh, MT lines provided very deep resistivity resistivity model. Uh, they the engineers uh, made some calculations and they came up with these equipotential lines where they could put um, the, the the grounding for these uh, for these power lines. Okay, so these were, were two papers from Arruda and Dart that uh, that was very nice. Were all the way in the northwest of Brazil. And wind farms, you can understand, you can imagine that these high towers, uh, you know, they are located in open, I'm going to show some pictures, in open exposed areas. This is actually, this is in the south of Brazil, is one of the highest areas that we have here. And this is in Bahia also, look at the type of grounding that we have, everything very resistive. And these high towers, you know, they're located in, in these areas where you have uh, a lot of danger from lightning, so the grounding of the structures has to be well done. So uh, just a quick example here. So this is the curve that was provided before, just a very shallow information, and now uh, AMT is just AMT provides like a, a more information in the case of uh, solar and wind farms. 
just a little bit, just like down to two kilometers, so that they uh, cover really the whole area of the of this park. And, and this is a picture of a of a solar farm in, in Brazil, and it's very large. And we work in this uh, also in Bahia. We work during the, the pandemic here, and um, I'm not going to show any data, but uh, just to show that this is another application. So these solar farms are getting larger and larger, and they need to have information about um, what is it, isn't it? And uh, what is the future? So I'm just going to show this video we participated in this. Uh, we, we went just to watch this report from Professor Michelle uh, Becken from Munster. And, um, you know, so now we have ground, we have airborne, and we might have uh, drone and trees. Okay, so with that, I finish my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Wonderful, Patricia. A wonderful overview of, of, um, of all the work you've been doing. Absolutely excellent. Uh, we have some uh, questions. I don't know if you can see the Q and A box. Let me let me look just a moment. Yeah, there's one from Francisco Porturas. If there's no seismic data, how will you calibrate MT measurements and interpretations? Uh, okay, well, sometimes we don't. I mean, sometimes we just do unconstrained inversion. That's what we do, you know. Like, for example, in the, in the case of the of the Kimberlites, actually, that Patty C's inversion that I showed was, was unconstrained. Um, we look for wells. That's what we do. More than seismic, I mean, seismic, we, we look for wells, you know. Um, there's another, there was another work that we did in the Paraná Basin. They had some wells there. So we mostly will look for, for wells that have resistivity information. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, from experience from the linear subsurface search for oil and gas, how effective when compared to the active seismic method? Well, I mean, the, the, the one thing that I can tell you is that, uh, and, and I think I showed that for, for Paris C's, in terms of like lateral structures, faults and the basement, I think MT can can give you a lot of information. Um, you know, of course, seismic, you know, if you are, uh, if you're going to really uh, define, uh, like in the sediments, that the seismic will give you a better picture. Uh, but I think if you can, uh, you know, I think it lacks some information about the basement and of uh, highly vertical structures that um, that, that um, and she can give to you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. About the MMT sun, isn't it? Look, I don't have a lot of experience with the with the MMT data. Right, let, just, let's uh, can we just read out the question from Biruk okay. Sherkosi because not everybody's seen the questions. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So he says, uh, you showed us the MMT in Santos. Does the movement of the water affect the magnetic and electric measurements when you do the marine MT? How do you control that? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, they, they do uh, corrections for the motion of the water, but I'm not. Uh, I don't really know how to um, to process MMT data. But yes, there are all kinds of corrections done. Also, because when the equipment falls on the on the bottom of the sea, you have to correct because it doesn't. It's not like on land that you uh, you know you know where where you align the, the fields and yeah? so you have to um, you have to make some corrections uh, and then from Francisco Porturas what kind of empty response do we get from the hot kitchen in geothermal I'm not quite sure what the hot kitchen is I don't know uh, well the 
okay, let me let me think. The hot kitchen. Then I would guess like a maybe even Alan can says. Uh, I would guess uh, what they were talking about. The it's a conductive response. I would I would guess you know, if it's because uh, you know resistivity is affected by by temperature. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Got any more questions? Has anyone got any more questions for uh, Patricia? No. Okay, if not, then I'll thank Patricia again for absolutely wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Unfortunately, I was a bit slow starting the recording, so the first two minutes <laughs> won't be won't be aren't recorded. <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll put the rest uh, up as soon as we get it. Um, and one thing, Patricia, maybe if you could make is your um, could your PowerPoint be made available? Yes, your, I can. Your slides. Yeah. yeah, I can. Um, I need some of, for example, the the A and P. Probably have to to take out. I'll, I will see. Okay. It. But then yeah, I will... so some of what you can because it, some of the slides came across a bit fuzzy. Ah, okay. So people okay. might want to look at those when they listen to your talk. Okay, no problem. I will uh, send to you then. See what okay. I can do. Okay. Right. So I'll just uh, finish off today. So, where are we? You're seeing my whole screen. <laughs> um, yeah, just want to finish off today talking about the upcoming uh, seminar uh, next week, um, Max Moore Camp, which will be at 1400 UT. Uh, why am I not seeing this? Excel. Okay. I was going to show you the... Uh, the uh, the advertisement again, but I won't. So next week uh, at 1400, we have Max. And um, I'd like to thank everybody. We had 75 attendees. So that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you again, Patricia, and thanks for everybody thank attending. All right, bye for now. Keep well and stay safe. Bye-bye.